Hi everybody, it's Tom Woods, and today we're going to talk about something called the socialist calculation problem. Now, I think this is going to be one of the shorter lessons, but I'm usually terrible at guessing that. In the Western Civ course, I kept saying this will be a short lesson, and then it's one of the longest ones. So I'm terrible at that, so don't hold me to that. But here's what we're talking about. This idea of the socialist calculation problem that we'll be discussing today comes from an economist named Ludwig von Mises, who wrote a famous article in 1920 called Economic Calculation in the Socialist Commonwealth. What Mises was trying to show in that article is that a socialist government is faced with basically a problem that cannot be solved. Now, when we talk about socialism in the sense in which Mises means it, we're referring to a system in which the government owns the means of production. Now, when we use the term means of production, we're talking about the things that are used in the production of consumer goods. So consumer goods are the things that you and I buy at the store. They're things you might buy at Walmart or Toys R Us, etc. Those are consumer goods. What are the types of goods that are used to produce those things? Well, there's a lot of machinery, right? There's there are factories that are used, all these sorts of things that go into the production of consumer goods that are necessary for the production of consumer goods, the machinery, the physical plant, etc. All those things are called the means of production. And in a classically socialist economy, the means of production are owned by the government. Now today we use the word socialism oftentimes very loosely, which is why I don't usually use the word socialism. People will say that some political candidate is a socialist, or they'll say Sweden is socialist, but they're not. I don't know of any U.S. political candidate who favors government ownership of the means of production. They favor a lot of stupid ideas, but they don't favor that. Likewise, Sweden does not have government ownership of the means of production. It has a large government budget, it has a lot of government involvement in people's lives. It has a substantial welfare state, but it does not have government ownership of the means of production. So Mises is talking about socialism as it was envisioned by real socialists. And he's arguing that there is a fatal flaw in the system. The fatal flaw in the system is not what most people usually think the fatal flaw is, which is that in a socialist system, everybody earns equal rewards, but if everybody earns equal rewards, why will people bother working if they know that their incomes will just be confiscated and redistributed equally to everybody? Why would anybody want to work in particularly dirty jobs? Why would anybody, anybody want to be a garbage man? If everybody gets the same reward anyway, who would want to be a garbage man? I'll just grow flowers or do something pleasant all day. These are not the issues with socialism that Mises was raising. He's, he's saying that even if you could somehow hypnotize people and get them to agree to perform dirty, undesirable tasks, and you could get them to agree that it's wonderful that I work all day and that guy's a bum and doesn't work at all, and yet we both earn the same income. That's wonderful. Even if we could get people to think that, you still have a fatal flaw in the system. And to understand the fatal flaw of the socialist system, we have to understand the merits of a system that's the opposite of the socialist system, and that is a capitalist or free market system. So first we want to look at what it is about a free market system that makes it work so well. And then we'll see that the absence of this thing is going to make the socialist system work very badly, or to put it more correctly, not work at all. And that is that the market economy has something called profit and loss calculation. So a business firm can find out whether it's doing well or badly by calculating profit and loss, by saying, okay, we spent all this money producing goods, and now we earned all this money by selling goods. And if the sales revenues are greater than the amount of money we put in to production, then we've earned profits. And that's society's way of saying, good job. You have added value to the goods in the world. You have done well. You have been good stewards of our resources. You haven't wasted them or produced things we don't want. You have produced things that we do want and that we highly value. That's the role of profit and loss calculation. So if somebody makes losses, 
then he either goes out of business or he quickly changes his plans. He produces something different or he produces the same good with a different production process. He saves money on his production process, whatever. But the profit and loss system is what alerts businessmen to how well they're doing in the eyes of the public. If the public likes what they're doing, then the businessman earns profits. When the businessman earns losses, that's society's way of saying, we're not so sure that you're, you're such a good steward of the resources you've been entrusted with. So let's put some meat on this. Uh, we'll give you sort of a thought experiment here. Let's uh, imagine a sample production process, a process that produces some consumer good, call it X. And this process requires, uses one ton of bricks, one ton of lumber, and one ton of steel. And the idea is that I combine these resources in some way, and the output is some consumer goods. I produce some consumer goods, I sell those consumer goods to the public, and I earn a certain amount of revenue. When they buy the stuff, I earn that money. And as an entrepreneur, I then go and compare the revenue I earned by selling the good against how much I spent on the bricks and on the lumber and on the steel, and I see how I'm doing. So if I earn more than I expend in making the goods, then I feel like I'm doing well. But if I'm earning a very small profit, or if in fact I'm spending more on production than I'm earning through sales, then I'm going to have to adjust my production decisions. Maybe I'll need less of one thing and more of another. Or maybe I need to locate my physical plant on the other side of town. Now on the other side of town, my transportation costs will be greater. I'll be farther away from where I want to sell my goods. But on the other hand, maybe land is cheaper there. So how do I weigh the savings that I'm going to get from buying cheaper land against the greater expense I'll have with transportation costs? Well, through prices. The price of the transportation cost against the price of the land. And that allows me to calculate whether it's a good decision for me to adjust my production process by moving my whole plant 15 miles away. I can figure this out in my head because I have prices of all these goods. These goods that I use, like bricks, like lumber, like steel, these are capital goods. These are goods that I use to make consumer goods that you and I purchase. C capital goods would be these inputs like bricks, like lumber, like steel. They would also be the physical plant. They would be the trucks I use to transport the goods. Again, it's, it's, these are all the means of production. These are the goods that are necessary to produce the consumer goods. And because there are prices for these capital goods that I use to produce my consumer goods, I can calculate profit and loss. I can say, I earned this much money, and now let's subtract the amount of money I spent on the capital goods, and then I see how I'm doing. So there are numbers attached to these things and it helps me to calculate it helps me to plan what kind of production process I should have should I use this production process to produce my good this production process that uses mostly lumber should I use that production process which uses mostly rubber let's say well without prices for these things how could I compare these options how could I know which option is more economical how could I know which one is more efficient? Which one is at the lowest cost? Which one saves resources the best for society? Well, in a free market economy, we have prices for all these inputs. Now, where do prices come about? I mean, how do they come about? Where do they come from? How do we get prices? Prices come about because we buy and sell. And the easiest way to think of where prices come from is to imagine an art auction. Like you all know how an art auction works. There's one work of art for sale at a time. And there's an auctioneer up there saying, okay, now we're going to auction off this painting. And then people make bids. Well, I'll bid a thousand dollars. I'll bid ten thousand dollars. I'll bid eleven thousand. And who wins? The high bid. The high bid wins that one item. So the price 
that is agreed upon for that work of art is agreed upon when all the buyers make bids and the highest bid wins. So you see, that's, it's very easy to see where prices of works in an art auction would come from. Well, in a, in a market economy, we can think of it as being like an art auction, except we have a bunch of buyers, just as we have at the auction for art, but we also have a bunch of sellers. We don't just have one person selling one item. We have a bunch of people selling a bunch of different things. And the interaction between these buyers and sellers yields a price. So a seller will offer some price, and if not that many people buy at that price, he'll lower it. And if maybe so many people are buying it that he sells out of his product, he'll raise it again. And eventually all the buying and selling yields us a price that's more or less settled upon. Now, they, never, they don't stay that way. Prices do fluctuate from time to time. But the prices move in response to decisions made freely by buyers and sellers. Now, these prices help us calculate what would be the best way to produce whatever it is we're producing, like widgets. So if this particular input, like lumber, let's say, or steel, is expensive, I have an interest in trying to find a way to make widgets that don't use lumber or steel. If there is any conceivable way for me to produce them without these expensive inputs, I'll find it. Now, the reason that that input, like lumber or steel, is expensive is that a lot of other production processes need it, and they're bidding for it. Again, think of the art auction. People really want something, they're going to bid really high. Well, if there's some input that everybody needs to produce their goods, like steel, that price is going to be bid up high. And that tells me that I better really, really need steel for my production process, because a lot of other people need it too, and that's why it's expensive. So if I need it, I better really need it. But if I can think of some other thing that I could use instead of steel, well, maybe I will. I see the price is high. Maybe I'll try to find something else. And that's the way that society makes sure that all the things we really, really need, the most urgent things get produced using the least cost production method. If I don't absolutely have to use steel, I won't. And that makes steel available to be used by people who are producing goods that have to use steel. If there weren't a price for steel, if there weren't any way for me to see steel is expensive, steel is scarce, steel is in high demand, I might use steel for a project that doesn't really need it, that could just as well get by without it, and that would be totally wasteful for society. My project doesn't even need steel, strictly speaking. I'm just using it because I have no way to tell what it costs. That would be a ridiculous waste of resources. It's because prices exist that I can then say, well, gee, I guess this thing's in high demand. Is there any way I could get away with not using it? And this is the way we make sure that steel is available for use for, those, for the production of those products that couldn't be produced without it. So you see, prices play an absolutely essential role in making sure that we make sensible economic decisions rather than foolish and wasteful ones. And what I've described here, this process by which the business firm decides how to produce what it wants to produce and where to be physically located and what resources should be combined in what ways to produce what consumer good, this is called social economizing. This is the process by which we try to produce the most highly valued goods that consumers want the most using the lowest valued inputs. So we try to produce as cheaply as we can, expending as few resources as we can, conserving as many resources as we can, not wasting the most expensive inputs, but making sure we use only the inputs we absolutely need so that other inputs are available for production processes that need them more urgently than we do. So all these countless possible combinations of goods producing countless possible things, it would be impossible if I didn't have prices to guide me. How would I know what to produce, where to produce it, in what quantity, using what method, using what inputs? I would have no idea. I wouldn't be able to, to decide that. But thanks to prices on the market economy, we make sure that we use the production process that we have to use and nothing more. That if 
if there's some input into my production process that's out of my reach because it's so expensive, that's because it's more urgently needed elsewhere. It would be wasteful for me to use that thing. And in fact, I would earn losses if I used that thing. That would be society's way of saying, we have more urgent uses for steel or lumber or iron or whatever it is. And so this way we make sure that our production is as efficient as possible, that we have the least waste possible, and that we're in any, any given situation always producing the things consumer, consumers value the most, but doing it in the most efficient, least cost way possible so that we conserve our resources for use in other production processes as well. So it's the price system which allows entrepreneurs to calculate profit and loss and allows for rational allocation decisions to be made. Allocation decisions are decisions regarding how much of this do I need, how much of that do I need, how much labor do I need, what types of labor do I need. These are allocation decisions. And so if entrepreneurs are making losses, they can figure out where the losses are coming from. Maybe it's not my whole business that's making losses. Maybe it's part of my business is a result of the losses. So if, I'm, if I have a bakery, maybe it's, my losses are, are coming from bread. I'm baking a lot of bread and nobody's buying it, so it's all going to waste and I'm wasting my money. But maybe everybody loves my pastries, so I'm staying afloat because I'm doing okay on the pastries, but I'm really losing on the bread. Well, maybe I'll scale back on the bread production and I'll expand the pastry production. I'd have no way of knowing that if I couldn't compare my revenues from different goods that I'm producing against the cost of the things, of the inputs, of the things that I use to make those consumer goods with. Now we get to the problem that socialism faces. It's a calculation problem. The socialist calculation problem runs as follows. And I, I guess you can probably see I was hinting at it. Because in the market economy, we have prices of the means of production. We have prices of all the inputs that, that go into producing things. And so I can calculate using arithmetic, profit and loss. But under socialism, they don't have that. They don't have prices of the means of production. So the central planning committee that plans all the production in the economy, that's what you have under socialism. You have a central planning committee that'll say, in our economy, we're going to produce this much concrete and this much steel and this much of this and this much of that. And then we're going to produce this many consumer goods. We're going to produce them in this way, in this location, in this quantity, etc. There's one central planning committee that owns, that has control over all the means of production. Therefore, there are no prices for the means of production. There are prices for consumer goods. If you had gone to communist Poland in 1970, you would have gone into a store and seen that a hairbrush cost you $2 or something. There were prices for consumer goods, but there are no prices for the means of production. Why not? Well, how, remember how we saw prices come about? Prices come about when owners sell things, and potential owners of those things buy them. Buying and selling gives rise to prices. We already talked about that. But if one entity owns everything, why would there be any buying and selling? There's one entity that already owns everything, and if this entity is given the job of deciding what's to be done with it all, they already own it all. There's no need for them to buy. They could sell. They could. The, the, the people on the committee could sell things to each other in like a game, but they already, they're already the owners of everything, or at least they have control over everything. So there is no buying and selling of the means of production. The government owns it all, and nobody else is allowed to own it. So there's no selling that goes on. And if there's no selling and no buying, there's no process that gives rise to prices. And so if there are no prices, how are they going to make production decisions? How do they know how to produce with what inputs, in what location, in what quantities, etc.? How are they going to know that? They have no way of knowing. So how are they going to be sure they're producing efficiently, that they're not producing ludicrously wastefully? How are they going to know that goods are being allocated in such a way that the highest valued ends of the consumers are being satisfied using the lowest valued means? Well, they have no way of knowing that. Maybe they'll use very highly valued means on goods that people value very little, thereby making it more difficult to produce other goods. I mean, how are they going to know? They have no baseline. They have no way to calculate profit and loss, which is the feedback system of a market economy telling businessmen, 
produce more this way, produce less that way, produce more of this, less of that. They have no feedback mechanism. And so the Central Planning Committee has to make decisions for hundreds of millions completely in the dark. Which production process is the most efficient? How can they know? What to produce, where to produce, how much to produce it, using what processes and what inputs? They have no guidance. They can't compare sales revenues against costs because they don't know what their costs are because they have no prices to compare them to. And so without prices, we are unable to make economizing decisions. Now, why do I mention this when basically there is no economy today, or hardly any, where the state owns all the means of production and plans the whole economy and doesn't allow individual entrepreneurs to, to plan the economy, to make decisions, to open businesses, but no, 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 they're going to decide everything, they're going to allocate everything. We don't have governments like that, really, anymore, worth speaking of. But yet, the socialist calculation problem is still partly relevant to us in a modern, non-socialist economy, because any government spending encounters a kind of calculation problem. Now, it's true that the U.S. government has a price system, yes. When the government wants to spend on something, it does know how much lumber costs, how much rubber costs, how much all these things cost, so they can figure out which things are highly valued and which things are desperately needed in production processes elsewhere. It does have a price system. But what it doesn't have, though, is the other aspect of a free market economy. Pri uh, free market economy has prices for the means of production, for capital goods, and it also has a profit-loss feedback mechanism. That's what government doesn't have. When government decides to spend, how does it know what to produce? How does it know where to produce it? How does it know how much to produce? Of course, it has no way of knowing. It has no non-arbitrary answer. Because government does not earn genuine revenue. Government doesn't sell its products to the public. Government gets its revenue from just taking stuff from people. It taxes the public. It just grabs their stuff. So it has no way of knowing how much of something people want. It has no way of knowing whether people want the things it's providing for them at all. Maybe we don't want these goods at all. It has no way of knowing. It can't calculate profit and loss because although it does, it does know what its costs are, it doesn't really have revenue. And if you're going to calculate profit and loss, you need to have an amount for costs and an amount for revenue. The socialist calculation problem is that they don't have an amount for costs because they don't have prices for the means of production. So they don't know how much their inputs are worth, so they can't calculate profit and loss. And here you have governments that, now they don't have revenue either because they're taxing the public in the socialist uh, world. They don't have revenue either, but they also can't figure out what their costs are, so they're totally in the dark. A modern non-socialist economy is partly in the dark. They do know what their costs are, but they don't know what their revenues are. They don't know how well the the public is responding to what they're producing. So they can't adjust, they can't know how to allocate resources. So for example, even the legal system, the most fundamental thing government provides, how do they know how many judges to have? One judge? 50,000 judges? Uh, how, how much law enforcement should there be? Should there be one policeman per house? Should there be one policeman per city block? Well, what type of law enforcement is necessary? There's no way of knowing because there's no feedback mechanism from the public. So you wind up with a whole lot of policemen uh, watching for speeders and not enough policemen solving murders, for example. I mean, like the, the, the number of murders that are actually solved successfully and the perpetrator is identified and punished is appallingly low. Well, this is part of the calculation problem. They don't know what to produce. They, there, there is no, whereas if there were a private security firm, for example, they would immediately know based on what their, their customers are saying and in terms of how much of their services they're buying and what they're paying for and whether their customers are staying with them or changing to another security firm, they would adjust the product that they're offering. The government doesn't adjust any of these sorts of products. And that could be true of government education, etc., there's no feedback mechanism in terms of revenue because the government doesn't earn voluntary revenue. It just takes people's money. So it can't tell how much people want the goods they're producing or whether people think they should be producing different goods or whether they should be 
producing the same goods but in different sorts of quantities and you should be producing this type of security or this type of education they have no way of knowing and this is the fundamental reason that government cannot be run like a business you hear this claim made by politicians all the time I'm a businessman so I'll know how to run government like a business you can't run government like a business because it's not financed like a business it's not financed by the voluntary decisions of consumers it's financed by the violent expropriation of consumers through taxation and so you can't know what the consumers feel about any particular thing so uh, when a businessman even makes decisions like uh, customer service you gotta have customer service but you can't spend all your profits on customer service or you'll go out of business but if you spend too little on customer service people are gonna be upset and you'll go out of business you gotta figure out exactly what's the optimal amount of customer service that's enough to satisfy people but not so much that it blows all my money well how does government figure that out it has no revenues that it doesn't take involuntarily from people so how does it know well it doesn't so instead it just under provides these things so you get long lines at the post office long lines at the department of motor vehicles because it can't calculate it it can't figure out what the optimal amount is that's why government can't possibly be run like a business it has to be run bureaucratically by bureaucrats just making arbitrary decisions because they can't calculate because they lack the essential entrepreneurial tools that businessmen enjoy in a free market economy the profit and loss system with their costs being able to be expressed in terms of market prices and their revenues also coming in the form of people voluntarily giving them their money because they like their product that's the only way you can allocate resources sensibly so this is the problem that's faced by all governments to one degree or another socialist or not